Antarctica has been an enigma since its discovery. There's even a medieval map of it without ice. It's been a target of Nazis, and Operation High Jump helped remystify it in the post-war era, when claims of UFO sightings and underground alien bases just keep appearing from under the melting ice cap. Let's explore. Hi everyone, and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor, and thanks for tuning in. We're operating on two principles here. One, everything is connected, and two, there are no coincidences. In 1513, Ahmed Piri Reis, a renowned Egyptian cartographer, made a map of Antarctica that is accurate to a one-tenth of a mile all around the coastline, and that's without ice. It was discovered in Turkey in 1929 by a German archaeologist by the name of Adolf Deismann. What was Peary's source? He never said how he knew of an iceless continent on the bottom of the world more than 200 years before it even was discovered. Another oddity about the Peary map is that it was drawn using a Mercator projection which allows for the calculation of the curvature of the planet, enabling more accurate drawing of coastlines and sizes of land masses relative to their location on a globe. And this was done before this technique was commonly in use, and 50 years before Magellan even proved the Earth was a globe. Yet, Piri Rice drew maps of the South Pole that assumed Earth was a globe. Between 1773 and World War II, Numerous expeditions were executed, including by Norwegians, Brits, New Zealanders, the US, and Russia. Everyone was interested in its pristine resources that included both coal and steel. And when Nazi Germany undertook a famous expedition in 1938 to claim for themselves a significant landmass in Antarctica, they named it Neue Swabenland. A rumored theory suggests a segment of the Nazi regime survived World War II in Antarctica at an underground base that was already there, retrofitted in collaboration with extraterrestrials, the Nordics, an off-planet Aryan race that is rumored to have collaborated with the Nazi war effort. In 1946, a Hungarian immigrant to Argentina, Ladislav Zabo, claimed to have seen Nazi U-boats in Patagonia on their way to the South Pole. Starting that same year in December 1946 and lasting until March 1947, the South Pole Summer, Defense Secretary James Forrestal assigned U.S. Navy Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who'd been to the South Pole twice, to put together an expedition named Operation High Jump. It was officially a resource and discovery mission, but in reality, it was a massive military mission that included 40 ships with 1,400 soldiers three dog sled teams, an explosives team, and they were carrying advanced spy camera systems, including the super-secret trimetricons, as well as magnetometers. Bird's fleet included a flag-bearing battleship, Mount Olympus, an aircraft carrier, Philippine Sea, a seaplane named Pine Sea, a submarine named Senate, the Bronson Destroyer, and the icebreaker, North Wind in addition to tankers and supply ships. This was a massive military operation. They may have been hunting down Nazis, but did Forrestal already know more? What we know about Forrestal at the time, former Secretary of the Navy and the first Secretary of Defense in post-war America, we know he was aware and privy to government discoveries of UFOs and extraterrestrial presence on Earth. We also know that he wanted to speak up about it, and we know he died in May 1949 at Bethesda Naval Hospital, prevented from talking to anyone, including his wife. He was thrown out of a window with a rope tied around his neck. Upon return to Washington, the entire findings of Operation High Jump was immediately classified as top secret. Byrd famously gave an interview in Santiago, Chile, returning from the South Pole where he spoke of the danger 
posed by aircraft capable of flying from pole to pole in a very short amount of time. On December 7, 2016, Buzz Aldrin was medevaced out of Antarctica to Christchurch, New Zealand due to an alleged altitude sickness. Earlier in the day, he had tweeted a picture of a pyramid-shaped mountain photographed on the South Pole with the caption, We are all in danger. It is evil itself, which is an odd manifestation of altitude sickness. The tweet was later deleted. Only a few weeks earlier, during the presidential election of 2016, Secretary of State John Kerry had shown up at the South Pole Station, the highest ranking US official to ever set foot on Antarctica, to observe climate change firsthand, or perhaps there was a matter requiring the presence of the US top diplomat at the time. On January 2nd, same year, 2016, UFO researcher and investigative journalist Linda Moulton Howe received an email from a 61-year-old retired Navy Petty Officer First Class Flight Engineer Brian S., who served more than a decade in Antarctica between 1984 and 1997 and flew over 300 missions and 4,000 hours on board a C-130 cargo plane transporting military scientists' equipment and supplies and he had a fascinating story to tell. His credentials are completely verifiable, and for the full interview audio recording, I recommend you visit earthfiles.com. Brian S. and his crew, while flying between McMurdo Station and South Pole Station, about a three and a half hour flight along the mountain range that separates East and West Antarctica, saw a flying disc, silvery in color and shining off the reflective sunlight. Sometimes they flew in formation, veering in and out of the mountain range. Sometimes they stopped on a dime, took a 90 degree turn, and exhibited incredible speed. Brian was aware of other crews who saw the same thing, but that's not the main story. On one occasion, in the mid-1980s, they were ordered to fly a medical evacuation route between South Pole Station and Camp Davis, but on that route, there is a no-fly zone about 10 miles away from the South Pole. It's an air sampling station, which is odd because an occasional flight at high altitude would hardly affect the air quality on the surface. Why was this then a no-fly zone? They were about to find out. In order to get an injured scientist as fast as they could to Davis Station, they decided to fly straight line across the no-fly zone instead of curving around it. And that's when they saw a square hole in the ice, perhaps 300 feet in diameter, the size of a football field, as if someone had taken a cookie cutter and taken a piece out of the ice block. The C-130 was still climbing at the time to about 12,000 feet, close enough for the crew to see what looked like a concrete ramp leading into the hole in the ice. It wasn't just a missing square of ice, it was a constructed opening leaning into something underneath the ice. And they even saw vehicle tracks leading to the entrance across the ice, coming from the South Pole Station. When the C-130 crew returned to McMurdo later that day, a guy in green fatigue showed up in their briefing room. After confirming the reason they broke the no-fly zone rule, he told them in no uncertain terms that they didn't see anything and that they were never going to talk about it with anyone. Then came 1994, when an unusual contingent of scientists was dropped off in the middle of nowhere in Mary Birdland, west side of the continent, west of McMurdo, west of the Ross Ice Sheet. All Brian and crew knew this was a science mission, and they never asked what kind of science, and the scientists never talked about it either. There was this understood knowledge separation between the military transport crews and the science ground crews. This was no different. They had dropped the 15 scientists off in Mary Birdland with housing units, snowmobiles, one month's worth of supplies and huge amounts of scientific equipment. And they were expected to check in every 24 hours to confirm they were okay. When three or four days passed and no one had heard a thing from the scientists, Brian and crew were sent out to look for them. They headed to the Mary Birdland station and flew circles around the campsite. 
Everything was there, their equipment, snow gear, snowmobiles, and supplies, but there was no sign of the scientists. They decided to land and investigate. No one was in the habitats or anywhere else around. It's as if they had disappeared off the face of the earth. It was just over two weeks later, three weeks into their one-month mission, that the scientists radioed McMurdo, asking to be picked up immediately. This was one full week before their intended duration time, and it was unusual for scientists not to milk every minute of their stay in Antarctica. But these guys were in a hurry. They wanted off the continent. Now, when Brian and crew landed, the scientists were more than ready to leave. They jumped on board the cargo plane without as much as looking at any of the crew. Inside the cargo bay, they sat down in two rows and stared down at their feet. There was zero small talk. It was odd. The crew hauled the equipment on board and took off. The three-hour flight back to McMurdo was strange, as Brian and crew observed to realize this group looked traumatized. They were clearly frightened, as if in a state of shock. Someone asked them if they were okay, and they just looked down and away, avoiding eye contact, saying nothing. When they landed at McMurdo, the scientists stayed in the plane until it was emptied out, and then they had to be herded out onto another transport plane that took them straight to Christchurch, New Zealand. That's how fast they were whisked off and away. There was no doubt in Brian and his crew's minds these guys were traumatized. They must have experienced something. Their science gear was stored separately in a storage building. It was declared top secret and off limits. Back in the debrief room, they were visited by two suited characters. Again, they were told they never saw anything. They never met the scientists in question, and they would never speak of this mission again. This was odd because there was really nothing that would have raised a suspicion other than the behavior of the scientists themselves. On a later date, the scientists' gear was flown to Ohio, they were told. No one said Wright-Patterson, which we know to be both the storage and research center for advanced technology. No, it was just being flown to Ohio. That's what they were told. What we will explore in a future episode is the evidence and disclosure testimony that Antarctica may have permanent bases underneath the ice. Giant concrete structures where a contingent of humans, scientists and military, collaborates with resident aliens that may have resided there for a very long time. How long? This offers additional perspective. The Antarctic continent covers over 5 million square miles, that is 14 million square kilometers. It is larger than the US, larger than China, larger than Canada, and one and one half the size of Australia. The last time it was completely without ice was 34 million years ago, but scientists have speculated parts of Antarctica may have been without ice as recently as 12,000 years ago based on their research in Antarctica. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness, and please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for listening. See you next time.